Today is Thursday, the 21st of July, 2022. Good afternoon and welcome to Newsbeat here on Metro TV. I am Desmond Okrekudans. We've got stories for you this afternoon and let's take a look at our headlines. Now, coming up, Senior Staff Association of Universities of Ghana toughens stance to stay off campuses. Parents are now being asked to let their wards remain at home until government addresses their concerns. We'll get into the details of that. And family of late President Mills at his hometown, Ekunfio Tiam, denies knowledge of rehabilitation works being undertaken by the government at his tomb. And on the foreign front, Russia resumes pumping gas to Europe through its biggest pipeline after warnings it could curb or halt supplies altogether. These are many more stories coming up this afternoon. And we are streaming live on Facebook at Metro TV Ghana. And also you can watch us live on DSTV Channel 277. Now let's settle for the details. And the Senior Staff Association of the University of Cape Coast says parents whose wards are at the university's basic level must desist from sending the awards to school since they cannot guarantee the safety of the children at the school. The local chairman of the association said this during an exercise to monitor the strike action instituted by the Mother Association. The Senior Staff Association of the Universities of Ghana declared an indefinite strike last week to demand for payment of all their Tier 2 outstanding interest from 2010 to 2016, implementation of the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission's directive on promotion and upgrading of senior staff members to senior members' positions. According to the University of Cape Coast leadership, teachers have only resorted to the peer-to-peer -peer mode of teaching. They say they cannot also guarantee the safety of school children, hence their decision for parents not to send their children to school. Speaking to Metro News after visiting the University of Cape Coast Basic School, Vice Chairman of the Association, Enoch Mensah Williams, says efforts to get government to pay them the arrest owed them have proven futile. We are on strike and so we are able to resolve our issues with government. We are not coming back. So please, parents, we are calling on you. Please make sure your children stay in the house. Their safety is what we seek for. After the strike, they can come back and continue with their education. It is better that way than we losing them. No one is at the basic school taking care of the children. You don't have the teachers there. There's no security there. So please, parents, we are calling on you. Please let your children stay in the house. We have issues with the government of Ghana and it's agencies and we are trying to resolve them. That does not mean we should risk our children. Please, after you've been able to resolve all the issues with the government of Ghana, the children can come back happily and sound to continue with their education. Let's now get some more explanation on this as we're joined by the chairman of the UCC Senior Staff Association, Sandy Kumi Sinatra, who joins us via Zoom. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Thank you for joining us here on Newsbeat. First of all, why have you maintained your stance despite government meeting at least one meeting actually one of your demands and agreeing to pay the 15 percent cola hello i can i can barely hear you sir okay so i'm asking that the government has a short yes. of the 15 percent cola so why are you still um you well, know behind this stance of yours i'm not getting any feed from your from your end Hello, Mr. Mr. Sandy, can you hear me? Okay, we are working the lines to get back um, Sandy Sinatra, who is the chairman of the UCC Senior Staff Association. Now, let's get back to him on. Uh, and uh, I was asking that government says that they are going to uh, actually give you the 15% cola and you're still standing by this stance of yours. Yes, uh, thank you, 
my brother, and uh, let me use the opportunity to say a very good afternoon to your cherished viewers. Yes, uh, before we declared the strike, we met the press and we briefed them and chronicled our grievances before we embarked on the strike. And as that time, we were having about seven demands, including the cooler. So if it's only cooler that government has dealt with, meaning we still have about six items in hanging. For that reason, we cannot call off our strike because the other issues are also equally important to us as much as the cola. So, so far as those issues have not been resolved, that is why we are still on strike. Can you walk us through what those issues are, the other um, six or five you're talking about? Yes, the government of Ghana is owing us monies, which is out of our uh, pension contribution. That government himself decided to be a fund manager and kept this money. Spent the Pensions Act, the, the, the rules are clear. When you decide to keep this money as a pension as a fund manager, you are supposed to refund or give this money back to the uh, uh, members. Then you pay them an interest. We met with government. We have done the computation of this interest. And it is over a year now. Our people are dying. Those who are on retirement are suffering because this is the money they also have to live on after their uh, productive life in the universities, and they are not getting this money. And this is a worrying to us as leaders. We have engaged government severally on it through the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, or, mm. and all means to get this money to pay up, been proven futile. That is why we have embarked on strike. Again, there are other allowances that has been agreed upon with the same government for senior staff. But unfortunately, uh, at the payments level, they have done some level of discrimination and paying it to a certain fraction of senior staff, which we are demanding that government should extend the generic allowance to cover everyone. Again, there are issues on our conditions of services, which are also hanging in the bosom of Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. And the attitude and the posture of the commissioner Engineer Benjamin Atta doesn't seem to suggest that he and his outfit or government is ready to engage us and has dared us to embark on strike. To, he will put his job on the line to make sure that we don't receive our salaries. Mm. These are the issues that compelled us to declare the strike, and we are still on it. Okay. When last did you have a meeting or try to reach out to government? Yes. Uh, it has taken the good hearts of our minister, that's the Minister of Education, Dr. Yao Edutu. Yes, uh, we respect him a lot. And out of that, he invited us yesterday. We met him. We had a lengthy deliberation uh, at this juncture. Uh, what the parties has agreed is that mm. the things that are within the bosom of the Ministry of Education, which boils down on some unfair labor practices in the universities, the minister is going to write to that effect to ensure that uh, calmness is brought back to the universities in resolving those issues. Those that are not in his purview, he has made arrangements. And in, in, in our presence, he started making calls mm. that those that need to be to ensure that those issues are resolved those people should also get on board as quickly as possible to suit to the resolve of our issues. You seem so to be at this. We okay. are meeting this afternoon again to have an MOU between ourselves as the association okay. and that of government. So that going forward, we will have clear timelines in knowing when the remaining issues are going to be dealt with. So we can also communicate the same to our members and see the possibility of suspending the current industrial action. And Until how, how then, soon would that be? Uh, if we meet and government, yes, sir. If we meet and government is still dragging its feet in meeting our demands that we are going to put in our, our MOU, then okay. the strike remain unabated. Okay, I, I was asking that how soon would that be? Um, I mean, it seems you had a fruitful discussion yesterday. 
Of course, yes. We had a fruitful discussion with the minister. But as I have indicated, okay. some of this goes beyond the Ministry of Education. And we need to get the commitment of the other sector ministers and agencies responsible to inform our decision of whether to suspend the current industrial action or not. Okay. Thank you for speaking to us here on Newsbeat. And Sandy Commissioner tries the chairman of the Senior Staff Association of the University of Cape Coast still on education. Now, basic ingredients like sugar is now absent from the meals of many senior high school students. The food shortage situation has become so severe that students are being fed porridge with salt for breakfast. Here is a report. Government through buffer stock said enough food items have been distributed to schools across the country to deal with the food shortage in senior high schools in the country. However, a visit to some schools in the northern region proves otherwise. Even though management of the schools declined to comment on the situation, our sources in the various schools in the regions indicated that government through buffer stock has not fulfilled its promise. In all, Metro News visited five schools in the region and the situation was almost the same. At Ghana Senior High School, students who spoke to Metro News could not hide their frustration over the kind of food they eat. Which food items have government sent for us? Can you imagine this morning we took porridge with salt, not even sugar and no bread. That's what we've been taking every morning. Due to that, some of us are no more coming for the dining. We prefer even taking our garris in the dormitory than coming to class that way. Sometimes when we go into the dining hall to take the food, we will take the food and you cannot eat the food. There is no oil in the food and some is salty again. Some of us, when we eat it, our tank, can I even show you? Look at my tank, that's the food. Wow. wow. So I prefer taking my garri in the morning. I don't go for the breakfast. There is no bread and there is no sugar in the porridge too for you to take. So I just prefer taking my garden in the morning than going there, taking the porridge, and I cannot take it into my stomach. It's very bad. Okay. Sometimes, you know, because of that, I don't feel like going. You go sometimes, either it's salty or no salt. No, like, it's just somehow. And there was a time they admitted a lot of students in the hospital. And they were saying it's like some of us, it's the kind of food they are eating in the school. It's causing all those things. Now, Deputy Minister of Education, Reverend John Itinfojo, has assured that the government will pay the 340 million cities debt owed the Ghana National Food Buffer Stock Company to ensure food supplies reach the various schools in the country complaining of food shortage. He spoke exclusively with Metro News. Between January and 19th of July this year alone, government has released and paid some 327 million cities. To, uh, to buffer stock and buffer stock has also in turn released and paid to various suppliers but that does not mean that there are no arrears it's a process as you are supplying and invoicing you are paying and there will also be an arrear uh, some arrears that you work the government is working towards so as revenue is trickling into government government re makes releases to deal with arrears so you pay and you still have some arrears and that is how governments are run everywhere and, and you go to the United States, UK, Canada, wherever, even in giant economies, government always has obligations that he's working towards. We have received reports that some schools ha ha have challenges with food. And we have got all those reports, we have outlined all those schools, and we have mapped up strategies. We have actually deployed food. Some of them have received. Those that are yet to receive, as soon as we get to know food, we'll get to them. So we are not... Um, debunking the fact that such challenges or complaints did not get to us. We got them because we are monitoring. Every day we are monitoring food levels in every school. So we know where schools, um, those who are having food challenges, and we are promptly responding to make sure that every school receives food. As we speak, food supplies have been received in most of the schools um, that had that, those complaints and at adequate levels. Supply will continue until every school receives food at adequate levels. We are monitoring that intervention we put in place and we have seen that food is reaching them. All the schools that are yet to receive, we are also monitoring keenly that they receive the supplies we have put in place. The Deputy Minister also said textbooks for the new education curriculum are being distributed to schools across the country. 
inspections to many of the, uh, the print houses. They are distributing. Many of the books have gone to regions, and the regions have in turn invited the district directors and heads of schools to come pick them up. So books are getting to the classrooms, and we are excited about that. Yes, there were some delays, but those delays were because we needed to ensure that quality assurance was done on the, on the books. You would not be excited that there will be books that will be found in classrooms with some problems on some pages. So every T needed to be crossed, every I needed to be dotted. We needed to ensure that the concepts that are contained in these books are very much aligned with the standard-based curriculum which is to ensure that there's collaboration, there's communication, there's teamwork, there's all the essential skills for the 21st century. That boosts creativity, innovation, that, that ensures that critical thinking is at the core. Away from education, exactly 78 years ago, former president John Evans at Mills was born. He died on July 24, 2012. This year marks exactly 10 years he passed away and a series of activities are scheduled to take place in his honor. However, there have been disagreements between his former aide and members of the NDC over whose right it is to hold the memorial. Meanwhile, family of the late president have denied any knowledge about the renovation of his tomb and are also demanding an immediate relocation of the remains of the late president to his hometown. <laughs> You I had that wash me in bed, the umbra, a mohun and nap. Then I now fray, and when I am in there, yea, we sent no moon or some four. Be me a would you join on to me a tie or ye? Then I know answer, as you answer, see a kind of man, nay, as a minute is lying there. What that there? Oh, me a baby. No regina hall, or damn or asher at a miss, I mean. Up will first walk and obey a statue, Miss Tatu bore her. Yeah, one year. The only John Bear, what had that? Obey a dabby, or asher at a miss, I mean. Oh, no, I am. So I ain't to do. No way, Funi, a clear car, what they had him there. Yes, so the brain. Well, <laughs> Let's now speak to our central regional correspondent, Akosi Hado, to tell us more on this. Good afternoon, Akosi. Thank you for joining us. Um, you visited his hometown. What exactly have they been telling you? How are they feeling about the ensuing disagreement uh, between Kokwa Nudo and the NDC party? Okay, so um, they are extremely disappointed at the turn of um, events. And then um, they say that um, looking at um, how peaceful and calm Professor Mills was during his day as they feel um, witnessing such controversy um, following his death. And then um, they decry that um, they were not pre informed about the supposed renovation of the uh, tomb that holds the remains of the former president. So um, the family is demanding for the remains of former president um, John Evans Atta Mills uh, to be brought back to the Kumfu Tram in the central region. 
Now they believe that um, when that is done, it would end the uh, controversy and also serve as a tourist attraction for the community. Now um, it's somehow disheartening witnessing the state uh, of the community where the late president hails from. Um, the area um, is still one of the most high areas in the region here, uh, even in the country at large. So um, people are very disappointed here. Yesterday, as we spoke to Wanyudo, we mentioned that some members of the family are aware of what is happening. I think that none of them have responded in the affirmative that they know about what is happening at the Asunjue Park. Uh, yes, they have no knowledge of what is happening at the Asunjue Park. And even with regards to preparations that are being made um, to have the 10th anniversary of his uh, passing observed to, um, the family said... Uh, as at now, they have not been engaged in any way uh, by any official from government or any other institution that is um, related. For the family themselves in Otum, are they organizing anything? Um, the family has not mentioned to me any sort of organization to um, have the passing away of the former president observed. Um, no, they have no such plans. Okay. Not of any way, no. Except that um, they, they feel disappointed, especially when we have um, the very house where the late president was born, uh, totally collapsing. Uh, and then you have um, the um, family members, close family members, uh, still living in abject poverty. Okay. Akusiado, thank you so much for the details there. We'll get back to you in our subsequent bulletins. Akusiado is our central regional correspondent. Still on the former president, uh, the late Fifi Atamels, members of parliament have paid glowing tribute to Ghana's late former president. And um, on the floor of the house, as part of activities commemorating his uh, third anniversary, read tribute to honor the memory of the late president who passed on some 10 years ago. Now away from uh, the former president at Mills to a survey that was carried out by the Ghana Statistical Service and other relevant institutions that had that majority of bribes paid to public officials in Ghana take the form of cash payments regardless of the type of public official to whom they are paid. For instance, in 2021, police officers received 96.9% of their bribes in the form of a cash payment and as did 93.7% of public utility officers, 94.1% of passport officials and 93.9% of custom officers. However, some public officials did accept bribes in non-cash forms. For example, only 45% of bribes paid to teachers, lecturers and professors were paid in cash. And uh, let's take a look at uh, the table showing the institutions there. So, uh, prevalence of bribery by type of public officials 2021, and you see police officers there with 53.2% uh, there. Uh, the GIS officers, 37.4%, and that's the Ghana Immigration Service, and GRE Customs officers, 33.6%, Lands Commission, 32.4%, and also the DVLA, 29.5%. There, so the Ghana Police Service officers leading uh, with the bribery uh, being received by public officials. Now, there's the Deputy Commissioner of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Richard Quasin, thinks the report by the Ghana Statistical Service on corruption shows a significant improvement in reducing the canker. To him, the data should encourage policymakers to do more, calling on the media to partner them in this quest. I will not say that we have made much a progress or improvement. But I think we can also see from the data that there has been some improvement that has taken place. But it is not so significant, not so significant. And we need to continue 
with what we are doing, which is the implementation of the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, which actually gives us a more comprehensive approach to fighting corruption. So, for me, it's also um, a validation of the, the need to have such comprehensive strategic plans for fighting corruption. You know, the NACAP will be uh, coming to an end in 2024. So this is also good news for us to begin to start planning because corruption does not sleep. So then we cannot go to sleep. So for me, the most important thing is not just the, the, the findings that we have made so far, but it, how we use the data to fight corruption effectively is what, for me, is most important. Unfortunately, and let me say this one uh, with a, a lot of regret, when we introduced the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, we, the approach was to ensure that all stakeholders, including media, including private sector, uh, civil society, all of them should be on board. Unfortunately for us, the media has not played the role that we, we expect them to play. Even though you have, you have been doing others to fight corruption, the role that we would have loved for you to play, I mean, intentionally and deliberately engaging in the fight against corruption so that we're able to make some progress. We have not seen that one. Yes, you have done some reporting on corrupt practices here and there, but that is not enough. Merely shouting corruption is not enough. When we have shouted corruption, the, the next thing is, how do we go about resolving it? And that is where I think I, I'm saying that the media didn't play that role effectively as we wanted. Let's stay a bit longer on this as we've been joined on phone by a member of Parliament's Defence and Interior Committee, Peter Turbo, for more on this. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. The survey is out, and the Ghana Police Service has been rated the most corrupt institution in the country. What are your reactions to that? Thank you very much, my brother. And then um, I think there's an opportunity for me to express an opinion. So thank you for the opportunity to speak on this. Um, when we talk about corruption in Ghana, and the fact that the police continue to top the chart over the years, people mistakenly begin to perceive the police institution as the most corrupt. That is a very wrong perception. And let me tell you why. The police institution globally is a reflection of every nation's status in the area of bribery and corruption, in the area of infection. So wherever you go, if you want to find out the status of a country, whether it's in Germany, it's in Norway, in Australia, it's in South Africa, it's in Ghana, it's in Egypt, you go look at the police. The police signifies the mirror nature of the country. The police is actually the mirror. So when you come to Ghana, the Ghana Police Service is the mirror of Ghana in the area of integrity, in the area of professionalism, in the area of bribery and corruption. So when you find the police topping the chart as the most corrupt institution, what it means is that the mirror is very clear that Ghana is really corrupt. And that is why it has been consolidated by the report from the, the Global Corruption Perception Index, putting Ghana on 73rd position with a score of 43. That tells you that Ghana is corrupt. You see, and the police work itself is so functional of corruption in the sense that it is structured in such a way. These are people with power. And these are people, the whole country is beginning to build up the police that we have, we call Ghana Police Service. So the police we have now is the making of Ghana. We have created that police. So if they are very corrupt, ask the question, why are we creating a very corrupt organization? How do we recruit our people? How do we train our people? How do we resource them? If you go for criminal investigations, for traveling from Accra to Tamale and staying for two weeks and come back, and you have subs subsistence to be paid, you have to refund that some monies. Do they pay that? Or you are supposed to be using your own pocket money to do that? When you put a criminal in cells or a suspect in cells, who feeds the suspect? Is the state having the capacity to continue to feed the suspect? Is the money coming from the investigator's pocket? Is it the family that is feeding the suspect? What is the risk associated with that? So there are so many things that come across and the police reflect what Ghana is. Ghana is corrupt and the police is a mirror. So when you begin to look at the mirror, you focus on the mirror, you only be seeing your own image. And let's not focus on the mirror. The mirror has shown us our image many, many times. Let's begin to have a whole of country approach. Honorable Tobu, how does this affect the police service? Because every year it seems they are on, on top. Are, are they not doing enough to keep this particular kanka in the service? That is the point I'm making that when you begin to look at the mirror, that the mirror should, should clean itself. 
the mirror should clean itself so that it doesn't look like a mirror again. You have missed the point. The mirror is telling you this is Ghana. The police service is a function of Ghana. The police service is a, it's an image of Ghana. So when the police service is corrupt, what we're saying is that the whole of the country should rise up and say, we don't want the police service to be the most corrupt. And if you don't want the most police service to be the most corrupt, all of us who are contributing to the police corruption should stop it. The influencers should stop influencing police. And police officers who are, who are getting involved in corrupt practices Police administration through the Professional Standards Bureau should deal radically with them and bring them to the book. Let them face the rigors of the law. So when the police are very hard within, the citizens should be very professional outside to ensure that you are not so quick to bribe the police. Let me give you a very clear example. I traveled somewhere in 2018 while I was coming back in the bus. A police officer stopped the bus and the driver was quick to take money into his license pack and started getting down to go and give it to the police officer. I stopped him from getting down from the vehicle and I ordered him to sit and wait for the police to come and let's see what he'll do. The police officer came, entered the bus first, greeted the passengers, walked to the driver, collected his license in our presence, looked at it and gave it back to him. And when he got down, he said, please save Jenny. Then I asked the driver, why were you quick to go down to go and give him money? He said, it is a practice. When I started learning how to drive, I used to see my master do it. So you see, even in the blood of the Ghanaian, the police officer is so powerful that you need to corrupt him so that you can have your way out. So the mentality of Ghana is, is to corrupt the policeman. Even if the police decide not to, co to collect that money, you see all the passengers in the car will be very angry with the police officer because he's wasting their time, he's been proven too tough, and why is he behaving like that? He's a wicked person. So the professional police officer is perceived as very wicked and not humane enough. And the one who collects the money and says, go, whether your, your tie is worn out and you can go and get accident and kill passengers, they don't care and the passenger will support that. We have a national problem and let's look for a national solution. Great. I was going to ask if someone had attempted giving you a bribe before. Many times. Mm. I, even when I was sitting in the IGP's office, if you ask, they'll tell you. Somebody comes to see my boss, the IGP, when he's coming out. Oh, Peter, how will you take something for lunch? And it's an envelope of maybe 1,000 Ghana cities. I said, so this is for lunch. This connotes something. I'm not interested in lunch. I think I can, my house is just around here. During lunch, I go home and I'm going to eat. Please keep your money. So people used to look, like, look at me like, maybe the guy has a lot of money. No, I have a lot of integrity. All right, I don't need you. money that I can explain. Thank you so much for speaking to us here on Newsbeat. And that was uh, Honorable Peter Tobu of uh, Parliament's Defence and Interior Committee. So watching Newsbeat here on Metro Television. We're taking a break. We'll be back shortly. It has been for the past years, we've not been increasing our prices and because of the way increment of the fuller is going, so we decided to increase our, our product so that we can also help ourselves and our car owners. Welcome back from the break to other stories and tipper drivers uh, have announced an upward adjustment in services with immediate effect. According to the National Tipper Track Drivers Association, the move has been necessitated by the continuous increment in the prices of full and spare parts. According to the truck drivers, they rex a total collapse of their business without the increment. The continuous hike in the prices of fuel, spare parts and vehicle maintenance is negatively affecting the smooth running of their business. The association says it has got to a point where they have no other option than to adjust their service charge. Per the increment, developers within Medina, Adenta and Legon will now pay 2,400 Ghana CDs for fine sand. 2,800 Ghana cities for stones and 3,000 Ghana cities for quarry dust. Delivery to the areas also have their respective increment rate. Medina, Legon and Adenta vicinity is 2,400. Dodua, 2,500. Abokubi, Uyibi is 2,500. Stone, for instance, is uh, Kasua is 2,000. Uh, Malam, Malam Botiano. Botiano Wija is 2,300. Malam Dansuma is 2,500. Riniba is 2,000. Seke Kanesi is 2,700. La Paz Achimota, 2,700. Sprinters Tema, 3,000 Ghana cities. Madina Legona Denta, 
2,800 cities. Dodua, 3,000 Ghana cities. The national chairman of the association, Kadi Inusa, says a tax force has been instituted to monitor and control activities of members to prevent illegal sand weaning activity. We don't have any much to talk to tell the government like reducing the fuel or anything. He said it was crisis about this uh, Ukraine and then the uh, COVID problem. So we don't have anything to say, but for we, we are looking up how best our work is going to improve or anything like that. Yeah. Some members of the association also spoke to Metro News and rating their challenges. About the fuel increment, it has been for the past years, we've not been increasing our prices and because of the way increment of the fuel is going, so we decided to increase our, our product so that we can also help ourselves and our car owners. Now, President Akufado has applauded the executive chairman of the Just One Group of Companies, Dr. Joseph Siao Ejepon, for contributing to Ghana's development in the area of waste management. The executive chairman was among a delegation that visited the Jubilee House on Wednesday to formally announce the passing and funeral arrangement of opening Samuel Kwame Ejapon, father of the businessman. Executive chairman of the Jospon Group of Companies was accompanied by members of his family to officially inform the president of plans to lay his late father to rest as custom demands. According to leader of the delegation, Ibusia Pengi Beruma Osei Beku, a burial service will be held at the State House on September 10 while he will be interred at his hometown of Bumku in the Eastern Region. President Akufuado appreciated the courtesy and hailed the businessman for supporting government. <laughs> And it's not time for some business news and Winston Taki is standing by with the stories. Hello Winston. Hello, Desmond. What do you have for us? All right, in business, I'll bring you inflation with regards to food inflation and also inflation the trend from January to June this year, right after this. And now to a false business story. Ghana has been experiencing rising inflation in the first half of 2022. That is from January to June 2022. Let's take a look on food inflation and how locally produced goods have been influenced. Now, as you can see on your screen, from January, we experienced a food January inflation of 13.9%, which increased to 15.7%. Uh, later, it reached in May, 27.6%. So if you look at a trend, we have been experiencing rising inflation from January to now July, which is, uh, we are hoping that certainly it will hit by 32.1% in July 2022. But as of June, it is still at 29.8%. This is a reliable data from the Ghana Statistical Service. Now let's take a look at a uh, food inflation trend uh, that also has been going higher from January this year. So if you go to the market, you realize that the price of food commodities keep rising at the rate that you see now. In January, we used to have a rate of 13.7%, which increased to 17.4%. Uh, at in May, we realized that the inflationary trend has increased to 30.1%, with June experience in the 30 point seven percent uh, food inflation so food prices in the market seems not to be going down any moment from now but how to how policy structures will put them in place is what we're looking forward to the mpc that is the monetary policy committee intends to adjust its rates in the coming days let's hope by monday we'll get a new announcement but with that going forward we hope the inflationary trend will come down
produce goods, goods that are produced locally in the country. So now when you produce, you realize that when you go to the market, the prices of locally produced goods are higher and producers are insisting that they are incurring a lot of costs in producing their item. Therefore, the prices keep increasing by the days, especially bread, grapes and some other locally produced items. So in January, locally produced goods was as low as 13.3%. That was inflation. Uh, May, it was 27.3% and it kept increasing to reach 29.2%, which was literally released by the Ghana Statistical Service for June 2022. Now, away from that, the president of the Association of Ghana Industries, Dr. Humphrey Ayim Dake, has called on the government to review the derelegation policy implemented by the National Petroleum Authority to reduce fuel prices, which is a primary driver of Ghana's rising inflation. How the fuels and the transport cost is driving the inflationary basket. The statistician has also indicated that diesel within that basket is over 81 percent inflationary and petrol is about 60 percent plus inflationary and an analysis that was done indicates that our bdc's because there has been a deregulation policy that we have been decentralizing to on the downstream section of our uh, uh, what do you call energy energy sector however this one this one scenario we have 35 bdc's importing about four plus million uh, fuel products into Ghana, i.e. petrol and diesel. However, they are not enjoying economic of scale. When you have 35 companies doing the same, and each company, some bring 5,000, some bring 2,000, some bring 20,000 and above. By virtue of imports, when you bring 20,000 above metric tons of fuel, FOB price will be cheaper, Freight charges will be cheaper. There will not be congestion at the port for demorage. The lecan that is released by the NPA will be quicker. And the few dollars you save will affect the pump price. That is one of the driving forces of our inflation and the various causes that are escalating. Deregulation is good. Policies are good. However, if you take your eye off the implementation and the feedback mechanism that helps you to perfect a policy intervention, you will have big problems. Let's now bring you an update on how the Ghana city is performing against global uh, currencies and also the prices of commodities across the world. I'll be all for business here on Newsbeats. My name is Winston Taki. Sports is next after this break. It's 49 past midday in the Ghanaian capital, Accra. It's time for sports, and my name is Phil John Quarty. The leadership and management of current league champions in Ghana, Santi Kosoko, will soon hit the market to look for a new coach. This follows the sudden resignation of their manager, Prosper Natogum. Let's hear the reaction from the supporters' union. I think what happened yesterday was something that, in my view, it should not even have happened at all. But this is a human institution, and you are dealing with human beings. Sometimes you never know what will trigger something for what happened like yesterday happened. But I think that the capability of the board to resolve the issue is what I'm, I'm looking at. If to resolve the issue between the coach and the management, if they think it's the best, provided the people involved can also accept the fact that they have to coexist and work for their sentiment, that will be fine. But if they think otherwise, that is also fine. For me, they should take the club into consideration. 
if the two or the parties coming together will not work we should not force them to we should not let them pretend all is well they will go and work it will be the i mean the repercussions will be bad if the people involved they are matured and as we all know they are very matured they can also bury the differences looking at the king looking at the supporters the support we all have Koto, we have we all have for kotoko if we can put all together and make kotoko run well that is fine officially there hasn't been any communique uh, from the club so what I would tell my supporters is that everybody should remain calm as we wait on the board and the management to tell us something. But we, we depend on them. So let's let's hold on. I mean with all the rumors and all those things. I for now I think we should treat everything with the contempt it deserves because there hasn't been anything official from the club. Uh, with regards to whether or not this is going to affect us uh, as far as our Africa campaign is concerned, I would say no. Because Asante Kotoko is a very big uh, uh, entity uh, and no individual is bigger than the club. Those are Miss reaction from Kotoko fans following the resignation of Prosper Nate Ogo. Let's get some facts about what he did at Kotoko. That will be on your screen, Speedy Soom. There you have it from here. A record as head coach of Kotoko. He won the club's first Ghana Premier League title since 2014, close to seven or eight years. The team picked the most points, 331 points, uh, on the road in that season. You see also over there, then under the tutelage of the man, the Kotoko, where scored the most goals of 48 and conceded 20 in the Ghana Premier League. You see in the facts about the gentleman who is 44 years, a lecturer at Cape Coast University, and is no more with Kotoko. Barring any last minute switch, he has resigned for Kotoko. Another fact in figures, in all, he played 34 matches for Kotoko during the Premier they like won 19, drew 10, and lost 5. There you see the start of the gentleman who has said enough is enough is done with Kotoko as their head coach. But just before we hand over to entertainment, let's go to Australia and Sydney and see the uh, ceremony that took place to mark the countdown of the 2023 Women's World Cup. Colourful ceremonies in Australia and New Zealand mark the one-year countdown to the ninth Women's World Cup on Wednesday, culminating in the lighting up of landmarks across the nine host cities. The 32-team tournament, the first Women's World Cup in the Southern Hemisphere, will kick off in Sydney and Auckland on July 20 next year when Australia's Matildas and New Zealand's football fans play their opening matches. A cultural lighting ceremony started the day at dawn in Hamilton, New Zealand, while FIFA Secretary General Fatima Samura was later on hand to unveil a unity pitch beside Sydney Harbour. The gap between the men's game and the women's game is going to get uh, smaller and smaller because we've seen after each World Cup that the number of people who register in the host country but also on the uh, countries that were part of the game is immediately multiplied by three. The prize pool for the 2019 tournament in France won by the United States was $30 million, and FIFA has already committed to a $60 million pot for next year. I definitely think so. I think women's football is just growing, honestly, by the day, and we can see that in the in the European Championships at the moment with the sold-out crowds and the new records every week, and I definitely think Australia and the whole world will definitely jump on that, and I think that is also building for this World Cup, and we're seeing progress you know, every month or so, and I think... This is, yeah, like I said, going to be one of the biggest events. So I'm very happy to be a part of it, hopefully, and, and here on home soil is nothing better. The 2019 tournament attracted... Well, that's your sports. My name is Phil John Quartier. Yeah, yeah, standing by for the latest in showbiz, yeah? Thank you, Johnny. Entertainment News is next. My name is Anaya Tanawache. Releasing new songs helps artists stay relevant as it's estimated that more than 60,000 songs are released on Spotify every day. To identify your song among the masses as an artist, software engineer expert Solomon Apia Sign has advised that although it's not mandatory to submit lyrics whilst uploading a song, adding lyrics makes it easier to find you as an artist. Aside you uploading the lyrics, mm -hmm. there's also something called Synchronization. Okay. That is where when you are listening to the song, let's say for Spotify as an example, the lyrics goes with the song. As the song progresses, you realize that the lyrics is in sync. Yeah. yeah. Right. 
So you can submit and it can stay there. Okay. When it happens like that, the lyrics will just appear. It won't sync with the song. Then when it sync, that means they, they map the time okay. of the song okay. to the words. Okay. Then when it's progressing, these um, lyrics are displayed okay. according to where the, the, the song has played to. Now, um, yes, when submitting songs, it is not mandatory to add the lyrics. Okay. It's not mandatory. So if you feel like you want to, fine. And there are um, services that also do this. Mm -hmm. There's AZ lyrics, there's lyrics fine, there's yeah. music match. All of yeah. these guys are there to, to sort help. these things out. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's just a matter of you as an artist seeing the need to mm -hmm. um, explore this part as well. Because okay. it means you are also um, allowing people to find you through that particular part. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline Champon, known professionally as Jackie, has shared the official track list of her upcoming EP titled My Diary. The six-track EP shared is set to be released this Friday, July 22, 2022. Announcing the track list, Jackie reviewed a feature collaboration with Nigerian superstar Davido, who is the only featured artist listed on the EP. After the release of her two singles, Something and most recently For My Baby, Jackie has been on the road promoting each song worldwide. That's all on entertainment news. Desmond, over to you. Thank you very much, Nanaya, for bringing us entertainment. I'm looking forward to that AP from Jackie. Up next is international news. The Moroccan Association for Human Rights has released a report putting the death toll from last month's attempt by hundreds of migrants to storm the border between the North African Kingdom and the Spanish enclave of Melilla higher than the official government tally. The report says at least 27 people, mostly from Sudan, South Sudan and Chad, died in the attempt with that number likely to rise as many more suffered severe injuries and 64 people remained missing. South Africa's inflation rate reached 7.4% in June from 6.5% in May. It is the highest rate since May 2009 when the rate was 8.0%. According to the national body, the main contributors to the 7.4% annual inflation rate were food and non-alcoholic beverages, housing and utilities, transport and miscellaneous goods and services. Russia has resumed pumping gas to Europe through its biggest pipeline after warnings it could curb or halt supplies altogether. The Nord Stream 1 pipeline restarted following a 10-day maintenance break but at a reduced level. Sri Lanka's Ranil Rikmanisinghe has been sworn in as president amid hopes that he will pull the country out of its economic suffering. The 73-year-old took his oath at the tightly guarded parliament complex on Thursday. And that's our wrap up the news this afternoon. Thank you for watching. We came to you live from the Ikea Boima Studios here at Northridge in Accra. I am Desmond Okay, we will be back at four with News Flash and seven with News Night. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. Have a good afternoon.